I'm a licensed psychotherapist. I've been licensed for over 30 years, and I've worked in the addiction field for over 30 years, and I'm also highly trained as a mental health nutritionist. Okay. Well, I've been noticing here in Iceland that people have been dealing with burnout and stress-related symptoms. Can you share with us what ways we can go to um, decrease stress in Absol our lives? Absolutely. A lot of therapists and people in the helping professions, as well as people who are caretakers at home with a sick family member or an elderly family member or an addicted family member, end up spending all their energy focused outward and taking care of other people. And what happens is that we lose sight of ourselves. We forget that empty wells cannot nurture anybody, and so we run out of juice because we're not um, rebuilding ourselves, we're not feeding ourselves, both spiritually as well as often real food, and we're not engaging in rejuvenating activity. Sometimes we get into this vicious cycle where we become too tired because we're taking care of other people, we simply become too tired to take care of ourselves appropriately. Because we're not relaxing and rejuvenating ourselves, we end up depleting our brains of the nutrients that we need in order to keep rebuilding the brain chemicals that give us energy, excitement, aliveness, as well as the ability to relax and rest and sleep. And so we get into this vicious cycle where we stop eating appropriately, we stop sleeping appropriately, we become more and more and more tired, and we are getting to the point where we're actually unable to give to the people who we love and want to take care of and want to um, be of assistance to, but we run out of juice. So, um, why is it so hard for people to quit sugar? And some people switch over to diet drinks. Is that helpful? One of the reasons it's so hard to give up sugar is because sugar itself is an addictive substance. And especially as we're moving towards burnout and we're becoming more and more tired, we often will turn to addictive substances to fire what's left of these neurotransmitters. So sugar, because sugar's everywhere and it tastes good and it makes us feel rewarded because it fires dopamine, um, it fires some of the other neurochemicals that make us feel good as well, such as endorphins and serotonin. These are the same chemicals that are fired by other addictive drugs. And so we become addicted to sugar and we need more and more and more of it. And it takes the place of healthier foods. Sugar then makes us more tired and it makes us more sick and it feeds that downward spiral. However, switching to diet drinks is even more dangerous because what a lot of people don't realize is that the, it's the sweet taste. It doesn't matter if it comes from sugar or aspartame or any of the other artificial sweeteners. The sweet taste itself stimulates the release of insulin which drives our blood sugar down. Once our blood sugar drops, several things happen. Adrenaline can kick in, which makes us anxious, agitated, sometimes even violent. And as our blood sugar continues to drop, we crave more sugar. So people will actually gain weight when they're using these diet products. The other problem, especially with aspartame, is that it's known as an excitotoxin. And what that means is, is that it actually excites the brain cell to death. So the more you drink diet soda, the more aspartame you use, the more you are actually killing your brain cells. Well, apparently we have a lot of brain cells that we're not necessarily using, so we don't notice this at first. But there have been some studies that indicate that somebody who's been using diet soda, aspartame, these chemicals their whole life 
over time it builds up and it actually begins to look like Alzheimer's disease in the brain itself. Whether or not it causes Alzheimer's, I don't know that we know that, but it ends up doing similar damage. The other thing that happens is that some people are essentially allergic or very sensitive to these chemicals. MSG is in the same class as excitotoxins as aspartame. And both of these chemicals can cause very strange physical symptoms. They can cause nerve pain and bone pain and joint pain. Um, they can cause muscle tightness and seizing up. As a child, we would go to a Chinese restaurant a lot, and I would know, I would love the Chinese food, but I would know that I would leave the restaurant with a backache every single time I ate at this restaurant. What I didn't know then, it was because they used MSG in the food. My body is sensitive to MSG, and it gets, the muscles get very tight and cramp, and that's why I had a backache. So I have to avoid MSG. Okay. So, uh, some people are dealing with addiction mm -hmm. and trying to get abstinent. Why are, is it so difficult? It's so difficult because we think of addiction as a three-legged illness. It's biochemical, it's psychosocial, and it's spiritual. Traditional treatment programs, including 12-step programs such as Alcoholics Anonymous, do a wonderful job addressing the psychosocial spiritual aspects of addiction. But they tend to ignore the brain. Well, this disorder is driven by the brain and it's driven by depleted brain chemicals known as neurotransmitters. The more you use an addictive drug, the less neurotransmitters you have. So you stop using and your brain, which needs this much to feel good, only has this much. And so it starts screaming, I need something, I need something. It feels like it's starving to death. That's known as a craving. Well. It's craving because these neurotransmitters are very depleted. We can use amino acids that you can buy online or at a vitamin store to very quickly rebuild these neurotransmitter stores and reduce craving and therefore reduce relapse. Many people after they've gone through acute withdrawal withdrawal, experience something known as post-acute withdrawal, which can last for months up to a year. This is depression, anxiety, insomnia, aggressiveness. And these emotions are very uncomfortable and also lead to relapse. Well, there tends to be two causes for post-acute withdrawal. One is the depleted neurotransmitters, which we can use amino acids to fix. The other is dysregulated blood sugar. Many, many addicts, and we think up to 80 to 90 percent of alcoholics, have what's known as hypoglycemia, which is a tendency of the blood sugar to go too high if it's exposed to sugar and then drop too low. Well, as blood sugar drops too low, several things happen. One, there's not enough blood flow and glucose utilization in the prefrontal cortex. This is where we are reminded that it's not a good idea to take that next drink. It's not a good idea to go call up your heroin dealer. It's not a good idea to eat the next donut um, because we want to stay clean, sober, and healthy. Um, this is also where we store our recovery skills. You know, go for a walk, pray, breathe, call your sponsor. Well, this part of the brain goes offline when it's not being fed adequately by healthy amounts of blood sugar. It also goes offline when adrenaline gets released. Well, as blood sugar drops too low or too quickly, the brain doesn't like this, and it says you do something, blood sugar is dropping too low, and the adrenaline, the adrenals secrete adrenaline. Well, adrenaline also puts the prefrontal cortex offline. And so we simply don't have access to our recovery skills. So this is why I recommend to every recovering addict out there, it doesn't matter what the addiction is, to be eating protein every four hours, starting within an hour of getting up, 
and then every four hours thereafter. That will keep blood sugar nice and stable. Mm. Premenstrual women should be eating sugar, sh sorry, should not be eating <laughs> sugar, should be eating protein every three hours to keep their blood sugar stable and prevent relapse. This, these 10 days before bleeding starts for women is a very high risk time for relapse mm. for women in recovery. Mm -hmm. And it's due to both dysregulated blood sugar, which becomes more dysregulated premenstrually, as well as low serotonin. And so using extra serotonin precursors, which are 5-HTP and tryptophan, which are easily found, as well as eating protein every three hours, will help protect premenstrual women from relapse. Mm. So what about anxiety? How would you address that? Well, an anxiety comes from a number of different places in the brain. We know that we can become anxious if we, um, some people have social anxiety or going into an anxiety producing situation. That's fairly normal. But very often people have anxiety because of what's happening in the brain, not because of what's happening in the environment. And this comes from a couple of different sources. As I mentioned earlier, when blood sugar drops too fast or too low, adrenaline kicks in. Now blood sugar can drop because you've had a high sugar meal or because you've skipped one or two meals. But as this blood sugar drops and adrenaline kicks in, adrenaline will have different effects on different people. In some people it makes them very anxious and very panicky. In other people it can make them aggressive and even very violent. So it's very important if you have anxiety, again, to make sure that you're eating this protein every three to four hours to keep blood sugar stable so that adrenaline doesn't have a chance to throw you off kilter. Mm -hmm. um, there are three types of uh, insomnia. Can you tell me about them? Yes. The first type of insomnia goes along with what we were talking about with the adrenaline rush. If people have dysregulated blood sugar, didn't have a good dinner, some people even need a snack before bed, if blood sugar drops in the middle of the night, just like if blood sugar drops in the middle of the day, there will be an adrenaline rush. Well, unfortunately, if this happens at 3 o'clock in the morning, it's going to wake you up and it's going to keep you awake and you're going to feel wide awake and ready and raring to go in the middle of the night. This is simply due to adrenaline and if you have a protein and complex carbohydrate snack, small one, we're not talking about a lot of food, just enough to raise blood sugar a little bit and turn off that adrenaline response, then people can go back to sleep and sleep well within five or 10 minutes rather than tossing and turning for the rest of the night. So that's one type of insomnia. Um, one of the others is due to low serotonin. Serotonin is one of our brain chemicals that allows us to be mellow and relaxed and calm and have a sense of humor and be flexible. However, if serotonin is low, we can have an anxious, agitated depression with a lot of obsessive thinking and worry and anxiety that will keep us awake at night. Mm. You know, we're, we're, we're thinking about tomorrow and we're wondering if we said something wrong to our you know, boss earlier in the day and what are we gonna do to handle this problem? So all these thoughts keep us awake. Taking, again, the precursor of serotonin, which is 5-HTP or tryptophan, will very quickly, within 15 minutes, raise serotonin levels and cut, shut off those obsessive thoughts and allow us to sleep. You do have to be careful with 5-HTP and tryptophan if you're on a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, such as Prozac or Zoloft then it would be useful to talk with somebody who's trained in nutritional therapy to help you manage that. You can, but you do need to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The other um, cause of insomnia is low GABA and low minerals. So GABA is the neurotransmitter that relaxes our body. So if GABA is low 
as if minerals are low because minerals also relax our body we have trouble sleeping because our body's tight and tense and we're restless and we can't get physically comfortable so if that's happening taking a GABA supplement such as low dose GABA um, which would be perhaps 100 to 200 milligrams you don't want to get too high with GABA mm -hmm. um, or a GABA um, uh, combination can help the body relax and then you can sleep. Also taking calcium and magnesium before bed or taking an herbal tea that is high in calcium and magnesium will also help. Okay. What can cause aggression and violence? So we tend to think of aggression and violence as being psychological issues or people are just bad people. This is very far from the truth. Yes, indeed, um, post-traumatic stress disorder can cause violent outbursts and growing up in a violent family where you learn violent behavior is true. But a lot of violence also comes from um, imbalance in the brain. So as I said earlier, when blood sugar drops too low and too fast and adrenaline kicks in, people can become violent as the result of adrenaline. We had a client once whose wife was about to divorce him because he would come home every night from work and scream and yell and throw and break things and was quite frightening. Well, he wasn't eating during the day. He would have a cup of coffee with sugar for breakfast, a bag of potato chips for lunch, and a candy bar on the way home from work. So he had a starving brain, and he was running on adrenaline. So the slightest thing would happen when he walked through the door, and he would just go off. Mm. As soon as he started eating the protein every four hours, and a protein bar on the way home from work rather than a candy bar, he became a completely different person and was able to cope with stress very, very differently. One of the other causes of violence in people is toxic, um, heavy metal toxicity. Mercury and lead poisoning can cause violence as well, as can toxic copper. We have a disorder where zinc gets very low, and if zinc gets low, copper can get very high, and that can lead to violence. And these things can be fairly easily tested for. Can you tell me a little bit more about this zinc, um, this disease that you're talking about? Can you tell me more about that? Yes. There is a genetic disorder that is not very well known because it is difficult to test for called pyroluria. Pyroluria is due to a anomaly in the creation of red blood cells that leads to a production of a chemical called cryptopyrrole. It can actually turn your urine a very pale purple if you have it very badly. Well, cryptopyrroles, which are not supposed to be in our body, bind it to zinc and vitamin B6 and excrete them from the body through your urine. Well, we desperately need enough zinc and B6 in order to make all of our brain chemicals, especially the ones that calm us down. Well, if we're losing zinc and B6 because of pyroluria, we can end up with an enormous amount of social anxiety um, and other mood disorders, including violence, irritability, things that look like ADD, things that look like bipolar disorder, and it appears that perhaps up to 70% of all alcoholics may actually be pyroluric. Mm. And they're using the alcohol and maybe other mood altering substances as well to deal with these extremely uncomfortable symptoms. This disorder is quite simply treated using um, fairly large amounts of B6 and um, zinc as well as some other nutrients. And there are some labs around the world that can accurately test for this disorder. Christina Veselak, thank you. You're very welcome.